Let's open to chapter 13 of Romans. Uh, just as an overview of where we're going, we're right in the middle of a look at the Lord's Prayer. And as we look at the Lord's Prayer, it's made up of petitions. And we've looked individually at the first five. We've come to the sixth petition. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. That's the sixth of the seven petitions. And we've already covered the first half of it. Lead us not into temptation and talked about temptation. Now we're in the second half of it. Deliver us from the evil one. And what we're looking at is how does God do that? We're supposed to be asking him to do it. We're supposed to be regularly seeking his deliverance. And his answer is that he has armor that is supposed to be part of our daily regimen of going through life. Now, all of us are here, and you, however you do it, you check the weather, you, you, or you knew the weather, and you decided it, there was not a foot of snow, so you don't have to wear boots. And you decide it's not five degrees, so you don't have to wear the parka. You know what I mean? And we make all these adjustments, mid-course and through life adjustments of what we wear. And, and we choose what we wear reflective on where we're going and what we're going to face. God says, if you realized what you're going to face every day, you would wear your armor. I remember my first uh, time as a senior pastor in Rhode Island. Uh, we got there, Bonnie and I, on December 31st and January 1st, 1989. We were starting in ministry, and we weren't there more than three or four weeks before one of the young state troopers that attended the church was making a routine traffic stop, and that morning, as he got ready, his wife said, honey, do you have your vest on? You know, the Kevlar bulletproof? He said, I'm just doing, you know, westerly to whatever today. I don't need it. And in the routine traffic stop, they shot him. And uh, I remember racing down. It was the only time I sat between the commandant of the state police and the governor of Rhode Island. And the three of us were sitting outside the emergency room surgery as we waited to see if he'd live. And I thought of that instant where the wife said to the trooper husband, don't you need to wear your vest? You know, we're going out into something more dangerous, more violent and deadly than just routine traffic stops with some maniac that shoots us. By the way, he survived gloriously, has a wonderful testimony, and I got to meet the governor and the commandant. But uh, uh, praise the Lord for skilled doctors. But the lesson is, we need to wear our armor every day. And the more you understand the second element, Satan's attacks, the more you understand why. Have you ever thought about how skilled you can get if you practice something long enough? Uh, most of us, you know, either you're a math whiz or you're not. But can you imagine studying math for 10 years under the master? How about for 100 years? How would you like to have known Einstein and Newton and, you know, Aristotelian whatever, and you could have learned from them? How about 1,000 years of studying math? You'd really be good at it. Satan has been studying warfare against humans for thousands of years. And he is the most skilled, the most practiced, and the most lethal evil imaginable. And he knows how to attack us. And God said, that is a given. This is not. It's a choice. And so what we're looking at this morning is, how are we doing at choosing to do what God said to deliver us from the evil one? And so this morning, the bottom line is we must wear the armor of God. Edward Gibbon, uh, the 18th century uh, English historian who wrote the, the classic history of the Roman Empire. It's called The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. It's six volumes long. It's a masterpiece. Uh, this is what he came up with among the other causes of the, the military. Now, the societal moral decline he attributed, interestingly enough, to the rise of homosexuality. He said that ate the core uh, or the heart of the Roman Empire. But militarily, what destroyed them or caused them to fall was this, which I thought was fascinating. The military decline of Rome's nearly invincible legions came with a gradual decline in the discipline of wearing and using 
uncomfortable, bulky, heavy, and challenging armor. Now that's interesting. Today we could trace the weakness of the 21st century church. Similarly to a gradual decline in the discipline of wearing and using the uncomfortable. Did you know it's not comfortable to be vigilant, to be sober all the time, to be aware that we have an adversary who is seeking to devour us. It's not comfortable, the, it's bulky, it, it displaces other things in our life. I mean, you can't be up on everything. And you must uh, say no to something to allow something else into your life. And it's bulky, heavy, and challenging to understand the armor of God because it, it comes down to mastering portions of the Word of God. Not just reading them, not just studying them, not just memorizing them, but mastering them so that they are like Jesus demonstrated in his, his face-to-face with Satan in the wilderness, that he could instantly speak as a human the appropriate scripture for what the temptation was he faced. So I guess it depends on how safe we want to be and how undevoured. So basically, we could ask ourselves these questions. How well do you know the armor of God? Do you know what the armor of God is? How often do you think about wearing it? Do you need a wife to stand at the door and say, do you have your vest on? And it should be that all of us will not allow those around us to be taken. Did you know, it's interesting in the scripture, all the ways Satan can take us captive to do his will. That's what Paul says. For some are taken captive, 2 Timothy 2, 22 to 24, to do the will of the devil. What is one of the ways? Well, what's one of his names? Satan's name is Diabolos. Do you know what that means? The slanderers. If you've ever heard someone slander, you have seen, if they're a believer, the devil using their tongue for his purposes. He is a slanderer and he commandeers believers who don't wear their vest, who don't put on the armor. They're taken captive to do his will. How practiced are you in understanding how the armor works? How good are you at standing against all that Satan can throw at you? What's interesting is the Roman legions basically never lost. They were invincible when they followed Roman military protocol. Individually, each one was fitted with everything he needed. Three pieces of the armor they always wore. The other three, at the sound of any battle, they grabbed the other three. They grabbed their helmet, they grabbed their, their sword, and they grabbed their shield. But they always were girded wearing the breastplate and their feet were shod. As long as they were on duty as a soldier, that uncomfortable, bulky, uh, hard-to-wear stuff was, was welded to them. And that was just for physical combat. How much more for us, for spiritual combat. We need to ponder today and start with the first explanation of armor. And if you want to, I I put it up on the screen, but it's in Isaiah. We're going to really read the one that's in Romans. But in Isaiah 59, 17, this is a fascinating passage. It's the first explanation of the spiritual warfare armor. And, And who it's talking about is the Lord. The he, capitalized, is the Lord himself. And in this chapter, it's talking about God coming out and defending Israel. And there's a a prophetic element to this, and and it talks about the tribulation, but basically it's introed with God, for he put on righteousness as a breastplate. See, that's the breastplate of righteousness. Now you see where Paul gets that term. It's, It's describing what God, in anthropomorphic terms, what God, the Father, is an infinite spirit, non corporeal, means he doesn't have a body. But he uses for us to understand human terms, anthropomorphic. He, he takes the form that we understand of humans. And so God says, I am righteous, he is holy, he is just. But I wear that as, as a breastplate, as an example to us, and as a helmet of salvation. Now, does God have a head? Does a spirit have a head like this? Christ does, who is the the image of the invisible God in human flesh. But God the Father is a spirit. But he uses these terms, helmet of salvation in his head, and he put on the garments of vengeance. So basically, we could say one of the great reasons to wear the armor is that that's how God describes himself. And if God pictures himself wearing 
armor, how much more should we always want to have that armor? But let's go to Romans 13 because this is fascinating. Think about Romans 13 before we read it. As we turn onward to Romans, Paul is laying the groundwork for the church at Rome to be able to thrive right in the center of the Roman world. What was the Roman world like? What, what was going on there? It was a world filled with glittering distractions. I mean, uh, Bloomberg recently published the 10 spots you should go before you kick the can or something like that. I don't know how they put it, before your time is up. And, and it gave 10 sites in the world that, that everyone should visit. Uh, probably they have some travel company that is, you know, with them on that. But one of them was just Italy itself. It says, go to Italy and see the, the beauty of Italy and the wonders of the Roman Empire. Well, can you imagine they're all falling apart now and, and down? Can you imagine how glittering the distractions were, how numbing the materialism was, how paralyzing the temptations? Think of athletics that were performed in every gymnasium with total nudity. Can you imagine? That's why Gibbon said that, that homosexuality ate the moral heart out of the empire because of their athletics being merged with sensuality and the amazing, paralyzing temptations and Satan's blinding false teachings as, as Rome basically through the pantheon absorbed every religion of the world and just put them on a shelf. And so it was just kind of like the cauldron of every form of blinding false teaching was just promulgated throughout Rome and to the ends of the empire. And finally, the lacing of the culture with a simmering hostility to anybody that was, that was different. And the Christians were exclusive. They believed there was only one God living and true, only one way of salvation, only one Christ. And, and that provoked hostility because the Christians gradually pulled away from all the gladiatorial stuff, all of the athletic sensuality stuff, all of the, uh, the, the materialism thing, they, they took gladly the spoiling of their goods because they were looking for a heavenly city. And the people said, you are haters of humanity. That was the, the, what set in motion the persecutions and the martyrdom of Christians in the legal courts of Rome was they hated humanity. They wouldn't go along with the calendar of Rome. They wouldn't go along with the, the, the whole... Um, opera and, and plays that were so decadent, the Greco-Roman uh, theater. They wouldn't go along with the athletic sensuality. They wouldn't go along with the business sensuality. Prostitution was a part of business. And so they said, you hate everything. And you just love this Christos, they called him, Christ. And that was the hostility that simmered. Well, but to most of the New Testament world, this, this is what Paul said. They needed to know. They needed to know that Christendom could flourish there in that setting. And what we see is how does the church survive when it's so surrounded by the evil one? Follow along in your Bible. And do this, knowing the time that now it is high time to wake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Now listen to what Paul says, verse 12. Therefore let us cast off the works of darkness. That's the Ephesians 4, put off. And let us put on the armor of light. Now Paul takes all the pieces of armor and describes them as armor of light. That we are to be clothed, that we are to be walking with the protection of walking in the light. That's like John says in 1 John 1, 7, if we walk in the light. Now look at verse 13. Let us walk properly defined by the truth of God's word, as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not the way you used to be, not in lewdness and lust, not the way that you used to be, not in strife and envy. Christians are to be peacemakers. When we speak, you know if God's prompting what you speak when you sow it as a peacemaker. Do you remember what it says in Proverbs? There are seven things the Lord hates, yea, eight are an abomination. Do you remember what the first one is? Someone that sows discord. If you see someone that, that slanders and sows discord, they are abominable to God. And they're, they're walking not in the light. So walk properly as in the day, not in any of those things. But verse 14, how do you do that? Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's how we make no provision for the flesh. See, my flesh 
wants to be allured by materialism. My flesh wants to be, to be distracted. Uh, my flesh wants to be paralyzed by temptations. But how do I prevent that? Putting on Christ. Now, to the most troubled of all the churches, in fact, more chapters were written to the Corinthians uh, by Paul with all their problems, chapter after chapter of problems, Look what he sums up, the, the solution, in 2 Corinthians 6. This is how they would make it. By the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and left. Armor. Righteousness as a protection. And then in his very first epistle, uh, Paul, to, a, to a, the first, one of the first churches he had founded, Paul writes these words to the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 8. But let us who are of the day, he said, you were a night dweller, loving the darkness rather than light. Now you, your eyes have been opened, you've been turned from darkness to light, Acts 26, 18. Now you're of the day, be sober. That was last time's word. Remember, be vigilant, be sober. In 1 Peter, we looked at that. For your adversary, the devil's a roaring lion. Be sober, don't be intoxicated by the world. Don't let your flesh control you. Be sober, how? Putting on the breastplate of faith and, the hel and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. So Paul, again, is mirroring uh, this idea of warfare. Well, finally, we all need to turn back to, and this is what we're going to read uh, this morning, if you want to get to Ephesians 6 with me. Uh, this is the most complete armor of God passage. It's in Ephesians 6. It's the complete list of believers' armor. So this morning, God's armor is de defined right here. Satan's attacks we've been looking at, and we'll look at more. The choice is, is this complete list something that's right before your heart and mind on a daily basis? Is it in your closet? Is it accessible? Is it something that you know with all your heart you need to make it through the day? Honey, have you put on your vest? You're supposed to wear it every day. I can still, I mean, she was sitting in the waiting room too the wife of the trooper, weeping that she didn't force him to wear his vest. This morning, the complete list of the believer's armor, and starting at verse 10, if you look down in your Bibles, it's time for us all together as Christ's body to listen. This is the voice of God coming right through the Apostle Paul to us. And we and me and you but we need to hear and respond let's all stand together you follow along and i'll read and then we'll pray okay starting in verse 10 of ephesians 6 finally my brethren be strong in the lord and in the power of his might verse 11 put on the whole armor of god that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, verse 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Verse 13, therefore take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand an evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. By the way, the first three they were always supposed to wear. They're written in that order. Those were the constant Roman soldier articles. Continuing, verse 16, Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. The other three. And Paul lists them probably looking at a soldier he was chained to because these are prison epistles. And he looked his gear over and he said, this guy is doing that just for physical war. We face a far more dangerous enemy. Let's bow together. Father, we invite you to speak, O oh Lord, to us through your word. We invite you to stir our hearts as you can you can stir us, and it's even more powerful when we agree and invite you to do it. And so may this be a time that we are seeking for you to stir us up to love and to good works. 
and to obediently getting dressed in the armor of God so we can stand for you. And we ask you to deeply teach us from your word this morning. In the name of Jesus, we ask it. Amen. You may be seated. Basically, we've seen that we need to beware of the evil one. We covered that uh, for two weeks. Uh, Most recently, last week, we examined just who this evil one is that we're warned about. Because of what we've seen, we can understand why Jesus said all the time, every day and throughout the day, we're supposed to be asking for deliverance from the evil one. We're supposed to regularly ask God our Father to deliver us from the crippling and deadening power of the deceiver. I mean, they talk about uh, terrorists that are bomb makers and terrorists that are strategists, but they have a short lifespan. I mean, even if they, uh, you know, live to be 70 or 80, it's short in the scheme of things. Satan is the absolute perfect trained terrorist as far as crafting the art. He is the deceiver, we saw. He is the devil. He is a ministry disruptor. He's the one that knows how to blind our minds. Peter warns us that Satan prowls around, and when he finds one of those places that Paul calls them in Ephesians 4, an opening, he takes advantage of that opening in our life, and we'll see that and what he can do. And There's an opening from which he can launch his attack where he can devour us as believers. And what exactly are those places where Satan can find an open and unprotected spot? Well, go on back from Ephesians 6 to Ephesians 4 because we're going to actually look at the landing spots as you turn there. Ephesians 4 in just a moment. Paul warned the new believers in Ephesus that they must surrender no part of their lives to the devil. Because once they surrendered any part, it became a foothold. And Satan can focus his defeat on that area of our lives. And that's why they were to rid themselves of everything that could be used by Satan. Basically, these could be called landing places. In Ephesians 4, before Paul gives the, the armor passage, he talks about why they need the armor, the, the landing spots, the places that the devil can use. Uh, when we look back in history, landing places or footholds were the key to the outcome of World War II, especially uh, if we look both at the, the D-Day arrival on the coast of Normandy as well as the island hopping, and that's the one that's most um, clearly seen. On August 7, 1942, the Allies began their first offensive action after the months of devastation following Pearl Harbor. Allied strategists believed that the central Pacific fortress of Japan would only be cracked, not by seizing every island all the way to Japan, it would be too costly and take too long, but they decided on island hopping. And they would focus all their might on one island, conquer it, use it as an airstrip, and conquer another island within a comfortable distance for airplanes to be hopping between on their way toward bombing the island of Japan. And so that idea was to capture key islands one after another until Japan was within range of American bombers. And thus General Douglas MacArthur first focused on the Gilberts, then on the Marshalls, then on the Marianas, then on the Carolines, then the Palaus, and seemingly endless bloody battles until finally they were close enough to relentlessly bomb Japan to finally uh, their unconditional surrender. And what it says in Ephesians 4.25 is that even a small part of our life, if allowed to become a landing spot for the devil, can lead to ongoing spiritual peril. And, and I'm not going to go into the, the contemporary. We'll just talk about the words. But, but in the days ahead, there are so many places for the devil to land with our immersion in the media and the gaming and the music and the movies of our day because there's so much occultic. Remember, Satan runs the system. And whatever is most popular, he is most busy within it. And Satan takes the good and permeates it. It, It's kind of like someone said to me, uh, and I want to be very careful about this, but they said, uh, 
would you go to a presentation of the Bible, the resurrection in Christ, put on by such and such a church? I said, well, that church is primarily a conduit of poison. So would you drink milk produced in a plant that primarily makes poison? Would you drink milk? If it was good milk, but it was made in a plant that primarily produces poison. Would you? Not if you're wise. You see, we have to be careful. Satan runs the system. He's a poisoner. And we have to be on guard and not have anything, any media, any entertainment, any diversion, any recreation. We are always suspect because we know who's operating it. And we know that, that his desire is to insert poison everywhere. And so we're supposed to be vigilant, and we know that. Okay, what does it say in Ephesians 4.25? Therefore, putting away lying, one of the first ways Satan gets foothold is any untruthfulness in our lives. Lying. Why? He is the father of it. He's a murderer from the beginning. He doesn't abide in the truth. He's a liar from the beginning and the father of lies. And he loves lying. He's drawn to lying. And so let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. Why? Because we're members of one another. One person can defile people in the body with lies. So guard against lying. Verse 26, here's another danger area. Be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Anger opens the door to the devil. Have you ever been in a situation and the anger rises and the words and the thoughts are, sometimes it scares us. We, we say things that we, we've never said before. We would never think of saying that. But in the moment, in the, the anger of the moment, we say them. And in the background, we're thinking even worse things. Where, what's going on there? We've left the back door open and Satan is stuffing his fiery darts in and inflaming the ally of Satan, the traitor that lives within us, our flesh. And it, it, he inflames our flesh to do his bidding. So he says, don't give him a place, verse 27. And let him that stole steal no longer, will let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who is in need. So he says, be careful, stealing opens the door of the devil. Here's another one, verse 29. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, um, but only what is good for necessary edification. If what you say is not to encourage and build up, then you shouldn't say it, because that talking can be used by the devil. In the as the Bible says, and the more we talk, the more, the more we are possibly tools in the Satan's hand. We're vulnerable in the volume of words. So he says, don't, don't let any corrupt word come out of your mouth, only what's good for necessary edification, to impart grace. If you don't feel grace going out as you talk, then it's better to be quiet. Verse 30, why? Because when we grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom we were sealed for the day of of Redemption. These words can grieve the Holy Spirit. Stealing can grieve the Holy Spirit. Anger can grieve the Holy Spirit. Lying grieves the Holy Spirit. It, it quenches him. It, it keeps his, his vibrant empowering of our lives diminished. And then what happens is, look at verse 31. Bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking all can start rising. And that's why he says that grieves the Holy Spirit. Get rid of them. And in their place, verse 32, be kind to one another. Well, what does it look like when Satan hijacks someone? When Satan devours someone? What, what does it look like? Well, first of all, let's turn to Acts 5, because this one is fascinating. This one is probably the most graphic of all, and it opens the New Testament record of the New Testament church. Acts chapter 5, the first 11 verses, Ananias and Sapphira. There are only a handful of people in the Bible that are directly attacked by Satan. Most of us have no contact with Satan. He is orchestrating. We have contact with him through the system, through his demons, and through the world. He is constantly uh, attacking us, kind of corrosively trying to work his way in, but not himself, just through his system. But there are a handful of people that got a direct head-on attack of the devil. Job is one of them. Peter is one of them. Of course, Jesus is one of them. Ananias is one of them. David was one of them, too. But, but look at Ananias in chapter 5. Satan and his demons were attacking 
an individual who allowed them to attack. And here is a direct scriptural example of two believers who through their pride, through their hypocrisy, through their deceit, allowed a place for the devil. Now basically, if you read in context, the end of chapter 4 is talking about Barnabas, uh, verse 36, who in verse 37, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So this guy, Barnabas, sacrificed. And it was stunning to the church. It was exemplary. Barnabas became a hero of the church. And so everybody started thinking, wow, you come and in public bring a sacrificial gift and lay it at the feet of the apostles and you will just be, I mean, you will have instant Christian fame. And so, look at verse five, or chapter 5, verse 1. They, through this wrong choices, left the door open and Satan fills their hearts. That's what it says. And a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession. And he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it. And they brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, if you just read that, you'd think, what's wrong? Well, the Holy Spirit prompted Peter to see through this. Now, Peter didn't see it. Peter didn't have supernatural power. The Holy Spirit, as, as the voice of, of the Lord through Peter, Peter said, Ananias, and now this is prophetically speaking. He, Peter knew something only God could have told him. Why has Satan filled your heart to lie against the Holy Spirit? He said, whoa, let's unpack that. This is a believer because Peter is addressing him as a believer and he's facing what we would call uh, the ultimate form of chastisement, which is death, which God talks about three times in the New Testament, in uh, 1 John 5, in James 5, and in 1 Corinthians 11, and also it's in Revelation 2 and 3. Uh, but these two came purportedly, sacrificially, as, as uh, giving this offering, but Satan filled their hearts to lie, giving this gift publicly. They weren't just lying to the apostles, is what it's saying. Behind the apostles, the Holy Spirit, God himself was standing. And when they lied to the apostles, they were lying to the Holy Spirit who watches everything we do and holds us accountable. And look what they did. They kept back part of the price of the land for yourself. Verse 4, while it remained, was it not your own? You didn't have to sell that land. And after you sold it, it was still your own. You didn't, it was under your control. You didn't have to give the money away. In other words, there's no Christian communism here. There's no communal living. All goods are not to be in common. It's okay to have private property. It's okay to buy and sell and have the money. What's wrong is to purport sacrifice, to lead people on to thinking you're making a great sacrifice. That is lying, and when you do it in the context of the church, you're lying, Ananias was, against the Holy Spirit. You have lied not to men, but to God. The end of verse 4. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. Wow. And look at the result. Great fear came upon all those who heard these things. I mean, it's just spreading like wildfire. Uh, watch out. You know, one false move and you're dead. Don't join that group, you know. Uh, it got rid of all the people that were genuine. And the young men arose, wrapped him up, carried him out, and buried him. And it took about three hours, verse 7 says. And his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Obviously, she wasn't watching her news feed and, you know, her Facebook and everything, and her cell phone probably was off, whatever. She didn't know about it. And Peter said, answered her, tell me, whether you sold the land for so much, and she said yes for so much. I mean, she had conspired and knew the line she's supposed to give, and she was coming now to have everybody think she was amazingly sacrificial for the Lord. And Peter said to her in verse 9, How is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at his feet, breathed her last, and the young men came, found her dead, carrying her out, buried her by her husband, verse 11, so great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. Amazing story, but look back at verse 3. What does Peter say? 
Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Ananias allowed Satan a place, and Satan, through that place, through that opening, filled Ananias' mind with lies. Now, it's interesting to read a commentary on this, and uh, of course I do, and I have hundreds of them. It's fascinating, and one of them said this, I don't believe in a, a righteous Christian's life Satan and demons have access in an obedient Christian's life, Satan and, demon do, Satan and demons do not have the opening. But somehow, Satan and demons can come and influence us through the system if we're open to them and living in disobedience. Then they have some access to the controlling factors of our conduct. Now, Paul Paul himself would enlarge on this in 2 Timothy 2, 22 and onward, and say, and of some are ca taken captive by the devil to do his will. That's, that's what is warned about in the scriptures. Titus 2, it says, don't allow Satan to hijack you and to use you for his will. And Satan does that for individuals. Secondly, Satan attacks couples, not just individuals, Couples. I mean, these two individuals each conspired in their heart to lie. But sometimes couples not guarded can also fall prey to Satan, hijacking them. And look at uh, 1 Corinthians 7, verses 3 through 5. Paul explains that Satan wants to disrupt marriages and families. Why? Because it's God's tool in this world. That's why there is more attack right now than ever in history on the family. There, no one wants to have a traditional biblical family with a husband who is a loving father who leads the home and a wife who is a godly mother who follows uh, in the biblical role that God has gender specifically given her. Satan is an all-out attack. He would like to have two men running a home or two women or a single this or that or a divorce this or that, but no operating biblical family. And one of the key ways he does so is in 1 Corinthians 7, 3 to 5. Paul tells us, look at verse 3. Let the husband fulfill his duty to the wife. That's talking about physically, sexually. And likewise, let the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but his wife does. In other words, you need to give your body to your partner. Why? Look at verse 5. Stop depriving one another unless it's by agreement for a time that you may devote yourselves to prayer and come together again, lest Satan tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Did you catch that? Couples who are not honoring the physical, sexual dimension of their marriage, which is not, well, it's my choice or not, it's God's commandment. Couples that aren't, leave open the door. Nothing would make Satan happier than to come against a Christian couple and because one is holding back the physical relationship against the other, raise the level of temptation to the one struggling with self-control and thus destroy the family. Often the person that withholds is the one that has total self-control and the one that is withheld from has struggles in self-control and Satan can find the weak one because of the disobedience and again, Satan can do that through the environment. Satan controls the environment that we live in so that we become unduly exposed to wicked temptations. And if there's an opening in our life because of disobedience, there's reason to think that he can somehow push that desire within us to a point that's destructive. Thirdly, Satan attacks leaders. It's, it's individuals, couples, leaders. In 1 Timothy 3, 7, it says, moreover, he, that's the spiritual leader, must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach, and listen to this, and the snare of the devil. When Paul laid out the standards for church leaders in 1 Timothy 3, he added a very interesting note. He said, Satan not only is against everybody, he's setting snares for leaders. I remember when I was in seminary, I mean, it was right in the middle of the Jimmy Swaggart deal and the Tammy Faye and Jimmy Baker deal, but that was not new. There have been every decade, every generation, 
Uh, Satan wants to entrap spiritual leaders in pride, entrap them in lust, entrap them in anger, entrap them in self-indulgence. And each of the spiritual qualifications, by the way, you should have gotten the nomination letter. It's going out. That whole process is launching now. But each of the spiritual qualifications for elders and deacons are there as a fence to keep church leaders outside of Satan's snares. And that's why they're to be maintaining this, this careful lifestyle that doesn't ensnare them. And as you pray, remember to pray for the elders and deacons of this church. Because without God's protection, going on their own, snares are always there. He sets traps for people's lives. Why? Because Satan wants to devour. I mean, that's his goal. You want to know what Satan gets up every morning? In fact, he doesn't sleep. He doesn't even need to eat. He is constantly at work. Do you know what he fills his mind with? How can he thwart God's plan? By devouring. And, and when Satan devours, do you remember, we, we know he's devouring us when we're overwhelmed by doubts. When we all of a sudden start doubting, I mean, is God good? Is God, uh, you know, just? Is, is, did he make a mistake? Uh, and we have doubts. I mean, can we trust his word? That's the opposite of faith. When we're immersed in fear. Perfect love casts out fear. Perfect doesn't mean perfect in the sense of, of absolutely perfect. It means mature, grown-up love casts out fear. If we're immersed in fear, we don't have that protection of God's love. <clears throat> And then we get consumed by selfishness. That's the opposite of love. And, and that's what it looks like when we're uh, devoured. Basically, Satan's goal is also to bring confusion. Uh, turn from Acts to chapter 3 of the, gospel, or I mean the epistle of James. James chapter 3, let me get there. And look at verse 13. James 3.13 uh, says this. Who is wise and understanding among you, let him show by the good conduct his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. In other words, you can look around and tell what is empowering someone. What, what is their source of energizing them to what they're doing? If they have good conduct and, and they have meekness of wisdom, that shows the Lord. But look at verse 14. If you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, don't boast and lie against the truth. In other words, if you have all these evil internal thoughts, don't share them. Because, verse 15, that envy and self-seeking and bitterness does not get downloaded from above, verse 15 says of James 3. Rather, it's earthly, sensual, and demonic. It's coming up from below. In other words, he continues, and this is a rule, for where envy and self-seeking exist, if, if you are listening or witnessing something and you see a, and sense envious talk, a self-seeking, someone that's, that's pushing their agenda, and confusion and every evil thing, that is not from God. Uh, there's a rule. Whenever you're in a meeting of believers and it gets confusing, you stop because it's the indication Satan has stepped into the room. He always brings confusion. God is not the author of confusion. Envy, strife, evil, confusion, self-seeking are not from God. But the wisdom is from above, verse 17, is first pure, then peaceable, then gentle, a willingness to yield. If you find someone that is unyielding, recalcitrant, you know, hard-hearted, they are not energized by God. They're stubborn, and that's part of the devil's realm. God makes us willing to yield, filled with mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those that make peace. So God's wisdom from above brings confidence. The evil one brings confusion. Uh, what should we do? Just cross the page to chapter 4, verse 7 of James. Uh, submit to God and resist the devil. Whenever confusion comes, whenever self-seeking comes, whenever, whenever you sense that he has entered the situation through his system, through his demons, or if you're one of the handful that, that the devil himself comes after, resist him because he's already defeated. As Martin Luther said, one little word will fell him because 
All we're supposed to do is resist him. And that comes by wearing the armor, understanding it, deploying it, as uncomfortable and bulky as it is, which prepares us for the relentless attacks. But God, in his amazing wisdom, says it's your choice. You want to get devoured? You want to live in fear? Do you want to constantly be driven by selfishness and destroy your life? If you don't wear my armor, the devil will devour you. It's your choice. Let's all stand for our closing word of prayer. And as you stand, some of you are saying, ah, you know what, you're talking in code. I don't understand all this. If you don't even understand, it says the natural man understandeth not the things of the Spirit of God. The Word of God doesn't make any sense to unsaved people. The first thing salvation does is it opens our eyes. We finally can understand God's Word. If you can't understand God's Word, you need an eye-opener. And the eye-opener is the Lord himself. And there are two ways you can access him in this building. Uh, he's not password protected. He's available everywhere. You can cry out to him right where you are. Or at the end of the service, we always have godly men and women that stand here at the front. And if you would like to connect with the Lord right where you are, as I've said to you dozens of times, he's an arm's length away. You can reach out to him. Whoever calls in the name of the Lord, he will respond. But if you need to talk to someone that can explain the word of God to you, they're here at the end. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Dear Father, I, I thank you for your armor. I pray that it would be as known as our wardrobe is, as longed over as we think about what we dress ourselves in. I pray that it would have priority in our lives that uh, we would be willing to sacrifice to understand and appropriate all the wonders of what your armor of God provides. And then I pray that we would resist the devil's attacks and that we would not just be personally caring for ourselves, making sure that we're victorious, but that we would think of those around us because Satan wants to attack the weakest. He wants to attack the the, those who are not vigilant and we're supposed to be exhorting one another and encouraging one another and stirring one another up so we ask for you to help us to not think merely of our own things but also the things of others and to encourage and protect and to build up and to love one another in Christ we pray that you would use your word to change us now in the precious name of Jesus and all God's people said Amen, and God bless you as you go.